personal views and opinions expressed by our podcast guests are their own and are not legal advice or official statements by their organizations. Hello, my name is Debbie Reynolds. They call me the Data Diva. This is the Data Diva Talks Privacy Podcast, where we discuss data privacy issues with industry leaders around the world with information that businesses need to know now. I have a special guest all the way from down under in Brisbane, Australia, uh, Nicole Stevenson. How are you? Oh, hello, Debbie. Thank you. I'm great. It's lovely to be here. Well, this is going to be a really great show. Uh, Nicole is someone that I really adore, uh, and it's been a thrill for me to get to know her and collaborate with her. Uh, Nicole and I, I think we met through a mutual friend, uh, Zoe Ether, uh, uh, around smart cities. And so Zoe, who's also been on the podcast, she, I call her like the queen of smart cities. And uh, and we've collaborated on different panels and we chat, chit chat on LinkedIn and you always put up really interesting stuff. So I would love to just say a few words about you and some of the things that you work on. Um, I know that you are, you hold the smart cities and critical infrastructure security professional designation. And you are a fellow of the Australian Information Security Association. Uh, you are also IAPP Knowledge Net Chair for Queensland, Brisbane, Gold Coast. You've also been the founder member uh, for the Australia and New Zealand region's Privacy Industry Membership Association, IAPP ANZ now part of the larger IAPP, where you sat for three consecutive terms on the board. You're also an active member of the Smart Cities Council for Australia, New Zealand. And you're also on the advisory board of the Center for Data Leadership. That's yeah, awesome. I'm pretty that's, busy. <laughs> that's a big list. That's a big list. In addition to being um, uh, having your own consultancy, uh, with, you're the owner and partner of IIS Partners in Australia. So you have a lot, lot going on, don't you? I surely do, but it's wonderful. It's, it's an exciting time to be in privacy and, and an exciting time to be in business in privacy, right? It's, um, it's great to have a consultancy. My little, my little consultancy, Ground Up Consulting, recently merged with IIS Partners. So we had we had been working together probably since about 2017 on some major projects um, because my consultancy was so small when I wanted to get involved in the big stuff, you know, you need to partner with a bigger firm. And so I was often, often partnering with IIS and sort of after a number of years of dating, right, we just decided to make it official and um, and go into business formally together. And it's it's just been such a joy and a treat um, my mentor, actually, Malcolm Crompton, who's a former federal privacy commissioner, he founded IIS Partners. And so for the last 22 years, obviously, I've had the opportunity to be mentored by this man and um, become friends along the way. And and now we're we're running business together along with our colleague, Mike Travato. And uh, it's just, yeah, it's, fan- it's really fantastic business-wise. It's a really happy time. And um, yeah, in terms of all the volunteer stuff, I think that's what you do, right? At this stage in your career, I know you do the same, Debbie. It's just, it's lovely to be able to give back and you just have to pick a couple of areas of interest to you and um, and start there. Yeah, it's always nice to be able to get to know other people. You know, I think even though we're in different locations, we're dealing with very similar challenges. So it's always interesting to get a point of view from people. And, you know, I've reached out to you on a number of occasions about different things as you've reached out to me. And it's been fun Mm -hmm. that we have kind of this international camaraderie among people that we feel comfortable to reach out to one another and ask each other questions. And I think it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And you know what, it just shows us how small the privacy professional community is as well there's there are there's a group of trusted experts i feel that we've both cultivated around the world that that when we have a question or a problem that's a good spot to reach out in a in a collegial way and just have a conversation and sometimes that's really all it takes to 
clarify things, particularly when you're talking about other jurisdictions. Um, yeah, it's really lovely. Yeah, I would love to talk about, uh, you, you deal with so many different issues. Uh, I remember something you had posted or you and I had talked about, we touched on a little bit, and this is around kind of uh, education, like technology in, in ed tech. Uh, yeah. And I think you had posted something many months ago about, I think it was your, your daughter's yeah. school or something. I can't remember what it was, yeah. but I've heard these oh, stories. Yeah in the past about parents who are privacy folks going into schools and seeing kind of the wacky things that schools are trying to do. And, you know, just, just your perspective, not just for, as a parent, but also as kind of a privacy professional. What do you think is happening in ed tech that you need to think about? Look, I think not enough is happening in privacy in ed tech. Um, that's just, you know, that's just my opinion, but I, I would venture to say that a number of privacy professionals feel the same way. I think I think there's two things to talk about. First is that privacy and cyber safety and safety and duty of care, those things, those concepts all come together when you're talking about schools and education and kids, right? And you almost have to look at them as a whole in order to work out the issues that you might have with all those those separate parts, right? So Often in that sort of ed tech space, we see we see schools saying things like, oh, we need to deploy this monitoring software because we have a duty of care to our kids, you know, to make sure that that when they're on school grounds and they're using technology, that they're doing so safely. And and if if we don't do that, then you know, we're we're in breach of our duty of care. And I think, well, duty of care is a pretty big topic, right? Pretty big concept. And it includes not doing things or, uh, or, or not failing to do things that would protect kids in their school environment, right? One of those things you would think would be protecting children's privacy, right? So failing to protect their privacy could potentially be a breach of a school's duty of care and, or their safety in online environments, right? You could, you could sort of take this conversation, you know, many different directions, but the point here is that schools are leveraging duty of care as a concept and or vendors are maybe leveraging the concept and getting their products into schools. And one of the examples that I raised last year was because this mom was talking to me about how her daughter had been um, suspended from school and uh, the reason or no, not suspended, I apologize, she was given detention at school. And the reason for this was because she had been caught watching Jojo Siwa videos, like YouTube videos uh, on her break. Now, I don't know about you, but like Jojo Siwa is this sort of, you know, like cute little bebop tween singer dancer that, you know, really, um, really kind of soft in terms of the things that you might see on, on YouTube or on music channels, right? and generationally really popular. And um, and this was considered unsafe activity by the school. Now, what I was more concerned about though, was one, how did the school know that this child was watching Jojo Siwa videos? But then the other, what were the parameters that they used to set what's safe or unsafe in the school environment? But then further than that, how come the mom didn't know that her daughter was being monitored like this at school at all, or that any of the kids are being monitored, right? So there's all these questions that were coming up and um, unpacking it from a duty of care perspective and from a privacy perspective was, was hard work. Um, and it got me feeling pretty frustrated about how schools generally are tackling technology. So yeah, I wrote a I wrote an article about it. I tried not to be too ranty, but it's it can be really challenging, um, and it's it's a space that I I try in a professional way, but also just in a collegial way to continue to educate schools about. I, I agree with that. Um, you know, I work with companies that are developing 
uh, technology in the education space. And it's kind of surprising. You know, they, I think a lot of times, sometimes I see designers, they're very excited about what they've created and stuff that they can do. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, I said, well, you can't do that. <laughs> Like, yeah, right. you 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 have created this innovation, but if you're applying it to the education space, you know, there are so many different levels of consent that has to happen. So mm-hmm. many things need to let parents know. Children can't consent, right, on mm-hmm. their own. So you can't have can't be monitoring them or like, you know, for example, uh, things through facial recognition is like going, you know, data being collected in databases or searches running mm-hmm. as open databases or I had one where someone, they were creating like a tool, like a sanitation tool to do UV, you know, UV sanitation wow. around the school. Yeah. But you can't, they're like, oh yeah, when, when people walk through the school, they can be zapped with UV. It's like, you can't zap people. No. <laughs> you cannot yeah. do that. It's, especially no. kids. No, no. You can, no, no it just see, doesn't work that way. No. This is what I'm thinking too, right? So there's this, there are, there are a number of companies that are, that are kind of working in this space. And there's one that I, I was looking at recently and I thought, oh, I do not know how you guys are getting away with this. So they're, they're uh, based over in the, the European economic area and they have a, a cloud-based tool that, that offers things like keystroke monitoring and uh, live screen monitoring for teachers. So, so say kids are learning remotely, which seems to be the way that we're going in a number of jurisdictions now with, you know, COVID lockdowns going on and off. And, um, and I get the challenges there. But imagine, you know, parents finding out that the school has, um, you know, remotely installed software on the laptop the kid is using at home, um, where the teacher can observe the child's screen. So what the child is doing in real time, including what they're typing, what they're looking at, um, and how fast they're completing their activities. And then if the teacher doesn't like it, the teacher can actually take a screenshot of what they see on the screen, um, date and time stamp it, and then stop the kid via remote access to their computer from from completing whatever the activity is that they're doing or watching whatever the video is that they're watching. Now, I just as a privacy professional see that as a bit of overkill. And what's worse is that this particular product leverages privacy by design when they're selling their stuff to the school. And and I I just I find that really challenging because privacy by design is pretty tricky when you're talking about a technology that is intended to invade privacy, right? I mean the starting point already privacy by design has been lost. So I'm I do I find this area really tricky. I find it frustrating. Uh, I find that it's in deep need of education, um, you know, both in the vendor space and in the buyer space, i.e. the schools. Um, And I'd like to see some uplift there for sure. Yeah. I think when people think about privacy by design, they only think about it from kind of a technological standpoint. So by design should also be about human behavior because you can Mm -hmm. have all the policies and procedures that you want, but if someone is misusing or abusing technology in some way, then, you know, that's part of the design. It's part of the policy. It's part of the training and education that's required for people to be able to use these types of tools. Mm. And, And it's actually, it's really quite impossible to look at privacy by design, say, uh, one principle at a time. So, you know, there's the seven foundational principles of privacy by design, but they're intended to be taken together as a whole, not looking just at one thing. So, for example, if you if you engineer, um, you know, end-to-end security as part of your product or your service offering, you're you're meeting an aspect of privacy by design, and that's awesome. But you can't say that on that basis alone, you have a privacy by designed solution. And I do think that this is where where vendors can fall down. And similarly, you're quite right that it's it's about there's that human condition element, the ethos of the company or the ethos of the vendor and what it is they're they're trying to provide. 
And privacy must be your starting point. So from the time you're even conceptualizing your idea before you start building it and before you bring it to market, it it needs to have privacy at its core. It needs to have privacy in mind. And I I do see the term, you know, particularly with the, the advent of the GDPR and privacy by design having so much more play. Um, Because we know it's been around since the 1990s as a concept when Dr. Ann Kabukian coined it all those years ago. But GDPR really brought it to the fore. And so now companies are leveraging the term because they see that it assists them with their um, sort of observable compliance. But I'm not necessarily sure that they're getting it right 100% of the time. I'd love to talk with you about privacy program management and sort of mm-hmm. culture around that. So um, uh, I don't know. I think when we think about people who have a privacy program, a lot of people think about people that either don't have a privacy program at all or people mm-hmm. who have one that's very well developed and very entrenched, maybe more into compliance than actual sort of behavior or uh, a reactive as opposed to proactive steps. But I'd love to talk yeah. to you about people who are sort of in the middle. So I'm, I don't know about you, but I find a lot of people in the middle where they may, they know that privacy is important in some way. They've tried something, you know, they may put some policies and procedures in place, not sure exactly mm-hmm. how to get to a maturity level where they need to be. Like, t- tell me a little bit about that story. I think yeah. it's really interesting. You know, I think I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding that privacy starts, good privacy practice starts with a good privacy policy. So you often see organizations, um, the first thing they do when they when they'll contact me and and they're they're wondering about privacy and, and where to go and, and how to get it done, the first thing they ask for is can you help us build a privacy policy? And it's through that conversation that I'm that that I'm able to show them that having a good privacy policy only provides you with good window dressing, right? It doesn't, you know, if people open up your shop front and have a look at what's inside, they need to actually see that you are doing what you say you do in your privacy policy and that you have the systems and the processes and the, um, I guess the ethos behind you that allows you to give effect to that policy, right? So, um, my advice for organizations that think that a good policy environment equals good information practice or a good privacy practice, I think that they're starting at the wrong place. So if you if you think about what good privacy program management looks like, it always starts with strategy, right? It starts with something strong at the foundation. So I know we often think strategy as being like an umbrella, but I like to think of it as a tree. So you have really a really strong root system to hold your tree up. And the root system is the foundation or your privacy strategy. And from that, you're able to kind of grow and nourish your privacy management framework and your privacy planning and any policies or procedures or processes that flow from that and any training that flows from that. But it does start with strategy. And strategy to my mind, isn't just some glossy document, right? Some glossy 500 page document that you stick on a shelf and it gathers dust. Um, it's, It's something else. It's about communicating within the organization what your beliefs are, what you think and feel and care about in terms of privacy and the community that you serve. And that is the best possible starting point for privacy. So, you know, if If, for example, you are uh, a company that deals with the community directly, they matter to you, their trust is incredibly important to you, having a privacy strategy that reflects that and your belief that that the community is your starting point with everything, um, it it helps to build out that culture in a way that simply having a good privacy policy wouldn't. Um, Also, you know, on the topic of policy, just for a second, you can have a whiz bang privacy policy. You can have the most excellent privacy policy that ticks all the boxes in terms of, you know, what should be what should be placed in it from a statutory perspective, right? You can meet all your transparency obligations, but still have 
a rubbish privacy culture and terrible information practice, right? You know, as long as your privacy policy tells the truth about what you're doing, you know, often companies think that that's enough. But if the privacy policy is is telling the truth about what you're doing and and on the face of it, you have terrible information practice and a terrible a terrible culture um, and, and are not showing a, a good degree of respect for the community that you serve. Well, that's a real shame. And, you know, there's an opportunity there to turn it around by starting with the roots of the tree and growing from there. Very good. I would love to talk to you about your notion uh, about this thing that people think about when they think about privacy. I hear corporations often think of privacy as a tax. It's like, oh my mm-hmm. goodness, this is extra thing that I didn't really care about before and now I have to do. And it's, you know, companies are doing so begrudgingly, some of them, uh, but I, I, I don't agree with that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that you don't either. But what, what do you say to organizations that may have that attitude when you first start working with them? That's like every organization <laughs> that I work with. It starts, it starts there where privacy is a compliance job. It's another hoop that they're jumping through. And by the time I speak to a number of organizations, they're already exhausted. So they already have a deep compliance burden across a variety of things, right? Like financial reporting and accountability or uh, cybersecurity uh, or human resources, workplace health and safety, you name it, right? There are so many compliance tasks that organizations have. If they view privacy as one of them, you know how it's talking about strategy before, if you view privacy only as a compliance task, you're viewing it at the policy level. If you view it as a strategic imperative, something that's important to you and critical to the operation of your business because you care about it, it stops being a task and starts being just what we do here. I agree with that. For people who don't know, what is kind of the, the latest and greatest thing happening with privacy regulation in Australia that people that maybe people be surprised about or they don't understand? I think uh, in my view, I think people don't understand how robust uh, uh, privacy regulation is in Australia compared to a lot of different other countries. What are your thoughts? I think there's a difference between robust and big, right? So to me, robust, I think it's sufficient for the purpose. It's working well. It it doesn't require a whole lot of change in order to be applied consistently across industry and public sector, those sorts of things, right? That's what I think of when I think of robust. I think we're trying to get there. So we're in a a process right now of um, a major legislative review on Australia's Privacy Act of 1988. And it has been reviewed a couple of times. This isn't the first time since 1988, but this is the biggest review. And um, I I see that there's potentially some some important and big change coming there. And I think that's wonderful. The, The thing about Australia's privacy landscape, though, right now that makes it big, but not necessarily robust and this is potentially a lesson for sort of our U.S. counterparts who are right now looking at the opportunity for federal privacy legislation. And I know that it's, you know, if this has been batted around for a number of years, Debbie, and privacy professionals get super excited and then they get super sad. But, you know, I, I do think federal privacy legislation is so important in order to regulate private sector entities. And to ensure that organizations that are servicing the community and the public sector entities across all the various states, that that they have a consistent framework that they're going to apply every single time. That we have in Australia. So we have our federal legislation regulates private sector as well as our Commonwealth government entities. Where it gets a little bit tricky is each of the states and territories in Australia except for two who don't have privacy legislation yet, which is appalling in this day and age. But I digress. We Each of the states and territories have their own privacy laws, and those laws regulate public sector entities here. So we have um, 
you know, that it can, it could be fairly complicated if we had more states and territories, right? So in terms of kind of that, the lessons for our U.S. counterparts, um, imagine, you know, 52 state-based public sector privacy laws, and then having your federal um, organize, you know, federal private sector privacy legislation overlay, you can imagine how complicated that would be in a much bigger country. But here we, we have a minimal number of states and territories to, to worry about. The challenge is though, is each of the privacy laws at that state level that regulate public sector are waiting to see what the federal government's gonna do in its big review before they do anything with those state-based laws. And it takes a long time for them to do that once they say, yep, we're gonna go ahead and push the button. We're still waiting another 18 months to two years before anything really happens. So there's a bigness here in terms of the amount of, of um, legislative requirements that potentially apply in this space, but it's still a bit fragmented. Additionally, in, in addition to the privacy laws we have, we also have um, we also have a consumer data right that at the moment applies in the financial services sector, but is looking to roll out to other sectors. So that adds a degree of complexity because that's about open data, right? So instead of um, keeping it back, holding it back, um, it's about giving it out. And so there's this tension with the consumer data right and our privacy laws. And in addition to that, we have um, a number of different information security laws that are tied to our um, sort of our, our federal national security objectives. And those laws often butt heads with the privacy regime. So it's definitely big here, but I think that there's a way to go before we could call it robust in, you know, in that positive way that we would view something as being robust. I don't know. I, I hear this from my counterparts in different countries where uh, I would say our privacy regulations in the U.S. are super duper not robust. <laughs> you know, they're just, <laughs> yeah. It's just kind of, you know, we have drabs and drabs of things from different places. Mm -hmm. We have things on federal level that cover certain things. It's definitely, you know, a patchwork or a work of nothing, right? So there's a lot of gaps there. There are a lot of things there. So I'm excited to see countries like Australia, Australia who yeah. have a, you know, privacy act or law regulation looking to modernize, you know, I think that's really mm -hmm. important. So we don't even have anything that we can monitor, mon you know, modernize at this point. We're just trying to create, you know, something. it's so funny. <laughs> Here, here we we call our our landscape often the privacy professionals here, and I won't speak for all of them, but I, the, those sort of within my collegial circle, we all kind of call it a patchwork quilt, and and you know we're we're used to our patchwork quilt, so we can navigate it okay, but we are looking forward to to some modernization. You know, catching up with the rest of the world would be great. I think it would also be great for Australia's economic relations with, with other parts of the world to ensure that there's that, um, that robustness of, of regimes in terms of the transferring and moving of personal information worldwide. Um, the United States, on the other hand, it's sort of like, you know, uh, an unfinished needlepoint cushion right? You know, there's, there's a couple of stitches here and a couple <laughs> of stitches there. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, I, I am encouraged uh, by what I'm seeing coming out of the U.S. in terms of all the dialogue around the importance of, um, you know, national privacy regulation. And I, I do hope to see that happen. I think it would make things a lot easier all around the world in terms of being able to deal meaningfully with companies in the U.S., I think it will definitely be a benefit. Um, I personally am not holding my breath here, but you know, <laughs> if it happens, that's great. You know, I've seen, you know, I've been watching this very closely for over 20 years. What's the area you you see the biggest gap in? Like, not let's not talk so big, like, you know, the the Schrems 2 decision making it hard for um, you know, businesses in the US to deal with their, you know. EU counterparts or companies that they're affiliated with. Let's not go that big. But in terms of problems that you think need addressing locally, what are the ones a federal privacy law would really nail for you guys? I think, 
you know, trying to harmonize the definitions of what personal data is or sensitive mm-hmm. data is, what the data breach notification requirements will be on a federal level as opposed to a state by state level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be tremendous, right? Because right now it's like every state is different. Some states want to be more bespoke than others. Some mm-hmm. don't have any any anything to say uh, about privacy in a meaningful way and a proactive way. Uh, a lot of them have stuff to say, like if you have a breach, right? And in, in the U.S., we sort of commingle cybersecurity with privacy a lot of times. So when you hear people mm-hmm. say cybersecurity, sometimes they're talking about privacy as well, and that's not the same thing, right? <laughs> so Oh, gosh, uh, let's talk about that for a second. Yes, oh, yeah. yes, yes. So how many times have I gone in to advise on a project and I ask, you know, after hearing all about the project and all the great things that they're going to do, I just, you know, very calmly and quietly say, well, what about privacy? And they say, oh, we we just told you we've got cybersecurity covered. And I say, oh, no, 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 no. (laughs) They're not the same thing. And here are all the reasons why, right? Um, I I like to say that, that privacy is about you know, if we're talking about protection for a second, privacy is about protecting personal information through its life cycle, but security is about protecting all the information. And, you know, personal information is just a subset of that. And, you know, arguably the most important one from my perspective as a professional. And, you know, I don't see, when we talk about protecting in the privacy sense, it's about thinking about your information practice, collecting the information appropriately according to a purpose, and then not using or disclosing that information outside those guardrails. And security professionals are are mainly seeing uh, technical solutions and controls that they place around data, right? All the information. But the personal stuff is, you know, a bit amorphous to them, I think. Yeah, it's, it's very confusing. Uh, you know, a lot of people I talk to, when you talk to them for a while, you see that they're, you know, confusing what those two things are. And some people are like, oh, you know, privacy and security obviously have a symbiotic relationship. But I told, mm-hmm. I tell people, you know, privacy existed before technology, right? So, so mm-hmm. this is a, more of a rights-based issue. And so the analogy I give is like, Think of a bank. So if someone in cybersecurity is protecting a bank, they're protecting the exterior of the bank, the interior of the bank, who comes and goes, like what's happening, everything having to do with the bank. That's what the cybersecurity folks have to protect, right? But we as privacy professionals, for example, we want to know what's in the vault and why is in there. <laughs> yeah. So understanding Absolutely. the why of that is, is what we really get down to. And then that's how you determine what needs to be protected in terms of the rights of individuals. So mm-hmm. that's the way I, I think that's kind of like. Our- <laughs> yeah, that is so, so true. <laughs> and I'm, I'm imagining too that, that like it's a difficult conversation. Right. It's particularly because privacy professionals are not brought in early enough. Still, I feel they're not being brought in early enough into the discussion. So kind of reverting back to that discussion earlier we had about privacy by design, bringing privacy professionals in at the inception of a project, when you're first thinking about its parameters and why you want to do the thing you're going to do, that's that's the time to engage a privacy professional, not when you're down to contracts administration, right? And you're just, often that's when when I get brought in is someone says, oh, do we have enough information about privacy in our in our vendor agreements? <laughs> and and I, I, I'm like, wow, um, probably not, no. <laughs> but in addition, you know, the the whole point here is that there's, you've had no opportunity to have visibility over, all you know, all the the why elements that you were talking about, you know, what's in there and and you know what's it doing there. We haven't had any visibility of that if we get in too late in the game. People have thought about cybersecurity or even managing data at a very reactive mm. way. So it's like, 
okay, we're not going to deal with it until something bad happens. And then we're going to like spring into action, right? And where privacy really needs to be a more proactive approach. It needs to be baked in, you know, as you said, it's part of the culture, it's part of the strategy, overall strategy for the company. So that you reduce, reduce situations or reduce mm-hmm. the risk that organizations have downstream when they're dealing with data. Um, yeah. I- I want to ask you about this is fascinating to me uh mm-hmm. there there's uh a, i would love for you to tell the story so uh choice magazine in australia had an expose i believe about particular organizations using kind of more emerging technologies in their stores and it is creating a uh privacy dust up in australia <laughs> and we're reading it about sure it is. here and i would love for you to tell the story about what's happening well, do you know what it is too? It's it's like one of those moments where, so imagine yourself in a school room for a second, right? And one of the children gets told to go stand in the corner because they've done the wrong thing. And all the kids watch. And then three days later, all the kids that were watching do the exact same thing, the exact same wrong thing. <laughs> and that's what's happened here. So, so Choice Magazine, found out that a um through through their um, investigative processes and and survey processes that uh, a number of Australia's major retailers are using facial recognition in their stores in order to catch baddies, right? And like i I get that. I think no no store really wants to have um, individuals coming on in and and shoplifting and you know, you know, reducing their their ability to to make profit, I I fully appreciate that. But there are guardrails for using technologies like that. And our privacy law is pretty specific about what's required before you deploy any technology that collects personal information from the community, right? Now, we we had a case in Australia recently. So this is the first kid that had to stand in the corner, right? Going back to that analogy, the first kid was 7 Eleven. And 7-Eleven was using a a survey tool or technique that involved taking pictures of people's faces um, when they they filled out their customer satisfaction survey when they were checking out of the store. And there was uh, a big investigation by the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner on this. And and it was found that 7-Eleven was indeed in breach of, of our privacy law. And the decision really set out all the ways that 7-Eleven had breached the law, like in in great detail. And it was a a super resource for the other kids in the classroom who were watching 7-Eleven standing in the corner. And I don't think any of these other Australian retailers, so it, it was Bunnings, Kmart Australia Limited, and the good guys, I don't think that they uh read the 7-Eleven decision. Or perhaps, I don't know, maybe didn't know that that had even happened because they've just now they have just been profiled for doing exactly the same thing or using a similar technology in a way that appears to be in breach of our law. And it's it's just it's gobsmacking. So the privacy professionals around here, we've just got our heads in our hands saying what on earth is going on. And, you know, I the other day I, I just made some really pointed remarks about, hey, you know, this has got to be only the tip of the iceberg if our major retailers are doing this. And these guys, okay, these are big companies. So they have compliance teams, they have legal teams, and they have privacy officers. And they have access to, you know, a plethora of information on the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner's website, right? They've got all that information at hand including that 7-Eleven decision. And, you know, they they have this, this ability, this lens that they can look through if they wanted to, doing privacy impact assessments right before they deploy technologies like this. And there are many consultancies, right from your big four firms and law firms, all the way down to the boutique privacy consultancies that do stuff like this every day. So they've got three opportunities there, their own privacy officers, <laughs> Right. The the federal commissioner's guidance materials and privacy impact assessments to get it right. 
And they haven't done any of those things. And now they've been profiled in a major way in the media and are going to suffer brand damage as a result. Yeah. So I did a video on that, uh, the 7-Eleven case. Uh, and, and I feel the same way. It's like everyone's falling into the same ditch somehow. Uh, and, and, and I think what happens, you know, we're seeing that in the U.S. too, where we see people, you know, companies get hit. Like, for example, I live in Illinois and we have a, the BIPA law, the biometric law in Illinois. And it's pretty, you know, it's like eight pages, very very plain and simple to understand. Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of mm -hmm. companies, big companies run afoul of that. And it's like, why? It's, it's very simple to, you know, you follow the steps to be able to do this. But I think what happens is there's a disconnect within the yep. organization. So it's like, you know, for example, let's say uh, a company has traditionally done like CCTV where they have a, a, like a static camera that just, you know, films people in stores and then they get the sales pitch like, hey, we give you, give you these new cameras and they have all these new technologies yeah. and bells and whistles. And they think, oh, okay, well, since we've had this in the past, this is kind of the new version of that. It's like a new car, right? And, and we yeah. don't have to do these other, have these other considerations. But when you're dealing with data of individuals, you do have to have these considerations and you have to be able to explain it. You have to do your homework. And, and the thing is, is if the technology is different, if it gathers the same personal information, but in a slightly different way, or manipulates it in a different way, or stores it in a different place, these are all new privacy considerations that, you know, have to be uh, looked at by that organization in order to determine if the risk is okay with them, or what are the ways that they can manage that risk. And, you know, out of the 7-Eleven decision, and, and certainly as we've seen with this, this latest choice expose, one of the biggest things that came up was not about the tech. And, and this is what's really interesting, Debbie. It actually is about the privacy program management. It's about the privacy program that sits behind the use of technologies or onboarding of vendors or whatever it is that the organization is doing. And what we're seeing, I think where part of the disconnect is, is that there's a lack of understanding about central privacy concepts. And then there's also, there's um, a lack of transparency. And transparency is a real a key tenet, right, of, of good privacy practice and program management. So what folks like 7-Eleven and then these other organizations have done is they think, oh, if I post a notice somewhere, you know, somewhere visible that people will see that there's cameras operating in the store, that's enough. But these notices are not specific enough to be truly transparent. Um, similarly, sometimes the notices or even the privacy policies that are posted by these companies say things like, by entering the store, you consent to be photographed. Well, a notice and a consent are not the same thing, right? A notice informs, it tells you what's what, it gives you some idea about what's going on. A notice informs, it doesn't ask. And I think that as a, a key learning is something that came out of the 7-Eleven decision. And now we're seeing, you know, these other retailers that have been um, engaged in sort of the same misunderstanding or, or same disconnect in terms of, um, what their obligation actually is. So I, I, yeah, I can't wait to see how this one washes out. Yeah, I, I think anyone, I've recommended anyone in any country, uh, if if you have customers that are implementing emerging tech to look at the 7-Eleven case, because it's very detailed and it will help you avoid problems uh, in, in the future if you're thinking about doing similar things in terms of implementing new technology. So it's, it, mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's easy for companies to fall into this. Uh, in, in a way, I feel like the way companies operate is probably one of the reasons why this creates a problem, because in, in a lot of companies, everything is sort of this part, you know, it's like Santa's workshop. Everyone's works on their little part, but like mm. you need to have people who can look at a higher level across, you know, different functions yeah. within the organization and figure out, okay, this is a problem because of X, Y, and Z as opposed to, okay, we had an old camera. 
we're gonna have a new camera and you just install it and then you know all hell mm-hmm. breaks loose. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that's the role of a, a chief privacy officer or a data protection officer or whatever you want to call that person in the organization to just kind of, you know, have their tentacles out within the organization and try to understand it on the whole, as opposed to just those component parts. Um, I look, I think it's it's really this is such a relevant space to be in. And when it comes to tech, I think it, it's also really important if you have somebody that's looking at it from that, from the privacy perspective and through that lens, you can also see that technology itself is not necessarily the problem. Technology is, you know, it doesn't really have thoughts and feelings. It's neutral, right? It's how we choose to deploy it as an organization that can really have us coming unstuck from a privacy perspective. So the facial recognition example is is one that that I think really resonates here because not all facial recognition is created equal, right? We we can use we can use facial recognition in a really uh, privacy proactive or positive way, like you know the way that we use face ID to open our phones, right? We can use it to to protect ourselves and our assets. And that could be seen as a, a privacy positive use of the technology. Um, but then when we're using it for surveillance or uh, covert um, law enforcement processes, for example, it doesn't sit so well with the community. So often we have to think about the technology and its purpose and its intended uses and the consequences of that. That is something a privacy professional is able to do in a way that that the folks on the ground who are just trying to come up with this, uh, you know, uh, a solution to whatever the problem is at hand, they may miss some of those nuances. Excellent. If it were the world according to you, Nicole, and we did everything you said, what would be your wish for privacy anywhere in the world? Where it be law, technology, regulation, program management? What are your thoughts? Okay. So on privacy law, I... I wish, but I know that it because privacy is relative to the jurisdiction that you're in and the socio-political climate that you're in, although I wish for harmonization, I I don't see that happening anytime soon at an international level because um, the regimes that we have around the world are just so, so very different, right? And the considerations um, for the privacy laws in those regimes are so, so very different. Um, that would be a big picture wish, just sort of like, you know, one day having a whole world government would be really cool, <laughs> right? But I don't see that really happening in my lifetime. Um, so I I think I'm going to stick to privacy strategy and culture building as being an area that, that we all have a real opportunity to get right. And if every company took some time to invest in privacy strategy, and to think about the community they serve when they're doing that, uh, I see them having a much greater level of downstream compliance when it comes to whatever privacy regime they are they are serving under. I love that. Very, you are a pragmatic lady, so that's a very good pragmatic <laughs> answer. Or something that we can actually achieve, right, on, on a case by case basis or a client by client. Yeah. Basis. Very good. Yeah. Well, it's been great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for waking up early in Australia to have this call with me. And I really appreciate it. And we'll talk soon. Uh, it was absolutely fabulous. And again, I'm just, I'm delighted. I love every opportunity you and I have to chat or collaborate. I just, I soak it in. Thank you so much, Debbie. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.